quote unquote suicide bomber, the jihadi who is willing to blow himself up for his faith, usually depicted in a very specific way. <clears throat> and this, of course, served as the pretext for uh, U.S. military members to die overseas protecting poppy fields and, of course, the corporate interests of oil and other sort of economic <clears throat> holdings in the Middle East based off of the foreign interest of the United Nations. However, this tactic was replicated previously in the 1940s with the attack on Pearl Harbor, in which a similar caricature was depicted of Japanese uh, willing to kill themselves, blow themselves up by crashing their own planes <coughs> based off of their faith in the emperor, their religious faith in the emperor. So these two tactics share a similar pattern or a similar appearance to them. But it does not explain exactly why the Japanese are so hated being depicted as the only place on earth to have been uh, hit by the atomic bombs. However, the explanation for this can be found in the book, The Great Ship from Amicon, Annals of Macau and the Old Japan Trade, 1555 to 1640, in which it uh, explains exactly what the Japanese did to the Portuguese Jesuits to acquire such, uh, the, such of the ire or hatred of them and the Roman Empire that currently runs the world and is, of course, behind in equally behind the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, as they have been behind so many other incidents of villainy that we will discover in the book. However, it should be noted that this book itself is from the pro-Roman perspective, as nearly everything is, and so even the damning uh, evidence in the book has to be taken with a grain of salt, and one must wonder exactly what else and what what uh, they did that was worse, which is um, obviously hidden, such as today we find out that there's all this pedophilia and child trafficking among the priest or the clergy priest class, uh, among other things, obviously fomenting wars and treason and whatnot. The book was published in Lisboa or Lisbon in 1959, Centro G. Estudos Históricos Ultramarinos, that's the Center of Historical uh, Marine Studies or, or um, Ultramarine Studies. So starting out, we're going to look at what exactly the Japanese did in this time period to the Jesuits in order to spark the uh, motive for Pearl Harbor and its connection to the Jesuits and their hatred of uh, the Japanese for what was done to them. <clears throat> they decided to end the Macau trade by prohibiting the Portuguese from all further intercourse with Japan. The arguments of the Dutch helped the Shogun and his counselors to make up their minds, but the overriding reason for this final decision was Iemitsu's neurotic fear of the subversive effects of Christian propaganda and his dread that the hegemony of the House of Tokugawa might be undermined by an unholy alliance between disgruntled Ronin and crypto-Christian elements secretly encouraged from Macau. Of course, those quote-unquote Christian elements are Jesuit, specifically. So they always like to, because this is written by Jesuits after all, they always like to hide behind the veil of uh, religion. When they get held accountable for crimes, it's because they're being persecuted for their quote-unquote faith. The first victim of this decision was the unfortunate Duarte Correa. Some might probably pronounce that Correa. <clears throat> Hard to say. Who, after languishing two, for two years in Omura jail, was burnt alive at Nagasaki on the 28th of May, having been savagely tortured previously in order to make him say something to implicate the city of Macau. An eyewitness account of this tragic end relates how he was bound on a lean horse and led through the town to the lodging of the Captain Majors, where he was allowed to speak with them and take a glass of wine. 
He complained bitterly of his sad lot, but the others had not the heart to answer him a word. On parting from them, he was brought to the execution ground and made fast to the stake, but the wood was wet and burned very slowly, so that he was gradually suffocated by the smoke. Our informant adds that at the height of his agony, Kohea, or Korea, called out to one of the interpreters, I tell all, I tell all, evidently hoping that this would induce his tormentors to shorten his sufferings, but they only laughed and jeered at him in his pain. And now we get the ultimate act uh, against the Jesuits that <clears throat> is the reason for Pearl Harbor <clears throat> and the use of U.S. troops specifically to exact uh, vengeance for a grudge they held for over 300 years. On the last day of August, a shogunal commissioner named Ota Bichu Nokami, Sukemune, probably saying that all wrong, arrived from Yedo with a decree which announced the end of the Portuguese trade with Japan. On the 2nd of September, Don Francisco G. Casalbranco and Don Joao Pereira, Pereira were brought from their prison house to the Buyo's official residence, where they were joined by Vasco Palia G. Almeida and four of the principal Portuguese from the recently arrived Galliots, or Gallio. Oda Bichu no Kami then made his appearance and addressed them per peremptorily through the interpreter as follows. You and your compatriots have continued to bring mish missionaries into the country despite the stringent laws against this practice. These missionaries and their converts have continually received aid and comfort from you and your compatriots to help them accomplish their designs. This has resulted in many of our vassals forsaking their bounden duty and thus caused the death of many. For all these reasons, your people are all worthy of death, and his imperial majesty should justly kill you. But he has condescended to spare your lives, and hereby ordains that you should leave Japan and never return. If you should subsequently break this command, you will then infallibly be punished as you now deserve to be. The contemporary Dutch narrator of these events, who undoubtedly derived his information from Japanese officials, who were present on this memorable occasion, adds, The Portuguese answered, with tears running down their cheeks, Whatever his imperial majesty wishes shall be done, but our sorrow compels us to tell your highness that we would beg you to punish the breakers of the Japanese law with death and to allow the innocent ones among us to continue this trade. For Macau gets nourishment from Japan, and if we are deprived of this trade, we will all relapse into the utmost destitution. But this answer was ignored, and it was ordered that the three charges of their misdeeds and the accompanying sentence of banishment should be translated into the Portuguese language and handed to them, so that they could maturely reflect and deliberate on the reasons for their plight, as were promptly done. They were then ordered to leave, and thus the two captain majors and the five newly arrived Portuguese separated from each other with wet eyes. Next, at a full council meeting in the Senate House on the 13th of March, 1640, it was unanimously resolved to send a special embassy to Japan, appealing against the Exclusion Edict of 1639, and petitioning for the reopening of the trade. Despite the obvious risks involved, four of the leading citizens with experience of Japan were selected to head this mission, which sailed in Nagalio on the 2nd June, carrying 6,000 pails in silver for payment of their expenses, but no merchandise whatsoever. All those on board had confessed and com communicated before embarkation, and services of intercession and atonement were offered daily in all the churches and convents for the success of the embassage, on which it was reckoned that the... The Gallio was secured immediately on its arrival at Nagasaki on the 6th July, all those on board being landed and confined at Deshima. The Buyo, Baba Saburo Saiyaman, received the envoys' letters and petitions and showed himself not wholly unfriendly at their audience. But he told them he could do nothing on his own responsibility, but would report everything to the Grand Council at Yedo for their decision. He also observed, rather ominously, that the emphatic verbal assurances given by the envoys that the Portuguese would abstain from any effort to spread Christianity in Japan in the future were not corroborated by the official letter from the city of Macau. This merely requested that the reopening of the trade so that the Portuguese could repay their Japanese creditors. Yemitsu and his counselors took less than 24 hours to make up their minds. They resolved to make such a drastic example of the luckless mission as would once 
for all deter the Portuguese from ever trying to enter Japan again. Two special commissioners were dispatched hot foot to Nagasaki with an edict signed by all the counselors of the Roju condemning all the members of the embassage to death, with the exception of 13 menials who were to be spared for the sole purpose of carrying the news of their compatriots' fate to Macau. The commissioners, accompanied by as many executioners as <coughs> there were victims to be beheaded, made a record journey between Yedo and Nagasaki, being only 10 days on the road. Within a few hours of their arrival, they summoned the Portuguese to an audience, the latter unwittingly thinking that a favorable answer was going to be returned to their petition, dressed themselves in their gala clothes and appeared before the commissioners in good spirits. But, wrote Francois Caron, in his graphic account of the ensuing tragedy, poor wretches, the matter went quite otherwise than they had expected, for they were addressed by the principal commissioner as follows. You villains! You have been forbidden ever to return to Japan on pain of death and have disobeyed that command. Last year you were guilty of death, but mercifully were granted your lives. Hence you have earned this time nothing but the most painful death, but since you have come without merchandise and only to beg for something, this sense, sentence is commuted to an easy death. The Portuguese were then tussed, trussed like turkeys and thrown into jail for the night which they passed in weeping and wailing, according to the Dutch account, or in prayer and thanksgiving, according to the survivors. Next, get, next day they were taken to Martyrs Mount, near Nagasaki, the scene of so many similar tragedies, where they were all beheaded except for the lucky 13. These last, after witnessing the execution of their 61 companions, and the subsequent burning of their galio with everything on board, were sent back to Nagasaki in a small Chinese junk on the 1st of September, with an insulting dispatch to the Senate of Macau, informing them of the fate of their embassy and warning them not to try anything of the kind in future. The citizens of Macau received the news with traditional Portuguese piety, many of them with tears of joy in their eyes, congratulating each other on such a good piece or piece of good fortune, especially the families and relatives of the martyrs, all whom dressed not in mourning but in gala clothes. They did not shut the windows of their houses from grief, but opened them wide, placing many lights in them and sounding shams and other musical instruments for many days. Singing many tuneful songs is a sign of their joy. It is a most noteworthy thing. So, how did they get to that point exactly? Well, doing the same things they usually do in every country that they usually corrupt or get involved in. Country, of course, meaning uh, land, <clears throat> not country as in the... Uh, the fake ones that they make uh, with the UN, the uh, puppet of the Vatican. Shortly after the departure of the Gallio from Nagasaki, Don Francisco de G. Castle Branco left on the annual mission to the court at Yedo at the no end of November. His suit suite was not very numerous or imposing one, and contrasts strangely with the train of people taken by the Dutch chief or Operhoof in later years as described by Engelbert Kempfer, and other travelers. Casa Bracco was accompanied by one assistant, four soldiers, two pages, and two blacks, apart from the Japanese officials and interpreters. Unfortunately for him, his arrival at Yedo coincided with the outbreak of the Shimabara Rebellion, when the persecuted peasantry and crypto-Christians of Arima and Amakusa rose against their feudal oppressors in one of the bloodiest and most famous episodes in Japanese history. The rebels used the Iberian war cry Santiago, St. James, and burnt Buddhist and Shinto temples wherever they found them. So the authorities naturally suspected that the movement was either inspired or supported or both by the Portuguese. The shogun and Roju, or Great Council, hesitated whether to receive Dom Francisco de Casobranco. They finally compromised by accepting the presents he brought on the 6th of February 1638, but declined to receive him in person. Shortly afterwards, Dom Francisco was told to return to Nagasaki where he was virtually held as a prisoner on suspicion of being implicated in the Shimabara Rebellion. According to one account, Castle Bronco's Norimono, or palanquin, was tied round with ropes when he came ashore from his boat at Nagasaki, so that he was not able to set foot on land or speak to anyone. The Japanese government issued an edict this year strictly forbidding the export of arms by foreigners from Japan and the Portuguese were discovered in the act of smuggling out a considerable quantity. When one of the returning galleos was searched for an English deserter, as Cox recorded in his diary 
on the 16th and 26th of October. Mr. Sayer wrote me that a frigate going out, they searched her to the very keel and opened all chests, thinking to have found Richard Short, but he could not be found. They found above 1,000 pikes, Laganote, Naginata halberd, and Catan's Katana sword, and brought them back, and would have stayed the pilot, but the Captain Moore stands bound to answer for all which is taken. Now in a different part. In accordance with his instructions to exact vengeance for the loss of Don Fernando de Silva and his ship in 1624, as Andre Lopez de Asaldegui's embassy in 1625 had not obtained restitution for all the cargo confiscated by the Siamese, Al Carazo seized and plundered several Siamese ships. And remembering the part played by the Japanese in the defeat and death of Don Fernando da Silva, he imprudently burnt a Japanese Red Seal junk in May of this year, returning to Manila with 42 Japanese prisoners after killing many of the crew and confiscating the Shoguno flag and passport. When news of this outrage reached Japan later in the same year, the Bakufu's reaction was prompt and vigorous. An embargo was placed on the three Portuguese galleos anchored at Nagasaki, two having already left, and the Portuguese were told that their lives and goods would be forfeit unless speedy satisfaction was forthcoming from Manila. In vain, the Portuguese pleaded that they were in no way responsible for the misdeeds of the Spaniards in Siam. The Japanese retorted that Spain and Portugal formed a dual monarchy, and hence the subjects of both crowns. Jointly responsible. The only redeeming feature in this critical situation from the Portuguese point of view was that a strict embargo was likewise placed on the Dutch trade and shipping in Japan. The Dutch had fallen into disgrace because of quarrels between Japanese adventurers and the Dutch authorities in Formosa, which culminated in the temporary kidnapping of Pieter Neutz, the governor of Castle Zeelandia, by Hamada Yahai, a relative and retainer of Suetsugu Heiso, the Daikwan or regent of Nagasaki. The Bakufu was not satisfied with his spectacular coup de main, but demanded that the Dutch should recognize Japanese sovereignty. And here we get another <clears throat> explanation of why the um, first event in the beginning was carried out the way it was. A party of Portuguese missionaries and merchants therefore visited this beautiful spot where they found that Padre Gaspar Vilela S.J. was busily engaged in converting the local population and had a built a church called Todos os Santos, All Saints, from the wood of the Buddhist temple in which he had originally been lodged. And, of course, the region was being ravaged by rebellion. No surprise there. Now, here's uh, something that happened uh, previously to all of that stuff. Uh, he confiscated the cargo of the San Felipe and, in February 1597, executed most of the Franciscan friars and a few Japanese Jesuits at Nagasaki on the grounds that they were what would be termed nowadays fifth columnists and disturbers of the public peace. Now... In a di different section, it states, Four riders of the conquistadors and, made, conquistadors and made things easier for the latter by converting the natives of the country or some of them beforehand. Obviously talking about Jesuits. Whatever the truth of these allegations, Hideyoshi made it quite clear to the governor of the Philippines when the latter protested against the execution of the friars that his action had been taken on purely political grounds and that he could no more tolerate the propagation of militant Christianity in Japan than could the Catholic princes of Europe allow Shinto or Buddhist in a different part, the Jesuits and the Portuguese, on the other hand, maintain that the Franciscans had brought their troubles on their own heads and involved the innocent Jesuits in their downfall by their opening, open flouting of Hideyoshi's official prohibition on Christianity. Yeah, right, like the Jesuits didn't do the same thing. <clears throat> Catholic princes of Europe allow Shinto or Buddhist missionaries in their realms. Many of the Spanish survivors from the San Felipe considered that Hideyoshi had been influenced in taking this decision by the hostile attitude of the Jesuit missionaries and the Macau merchants to their Spanish rivals from the Philippines. It was even alleged that the Portuguese had repeatedly warned Hideyoshi against Spanish expansionist tendencies and had denied or concealed the fact that King Philip was a lawful ruler of Portugal as well as of Spain. The persecution of Roman Catholic Christianity ha, 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 was worse ever was worse than ever this year and threatened at one point to involve the whole Portuguese trading community in ruin. A Portuguese Augustinian friar named Fray Francisco da Graça, Francisco da Graça, who had arrived in disguise from Manila in June with a party of Franciscans in a Chinese junk, was surprised in his host house by a search party. Although he temporarily made good his escape, he left, he un he left an unfinished letter which fell into the hands of the pur his pursuers 
This letter gave the names of all those who had helped him to evade discovery and arrest, prominent among whom were the factor of the city of Macau at Nagasaki, and Geronimo G. Machedo G. Carvalho, nominally a captive in Umura jail since 1623 but who has evidently allowed some freedom of movement and who had certainly supplied him with money. This incriminating document was read out to the leading members of the Portuguese community in the presence of the Buyu, Takenak, himself, and according to the rigor of the law, they should all have been burned without anyone's life being spared. The business was apparently hushed up by a colossal bribe to Takenaka, although Lopo Sarmento G. Cavallo alleged that the matter was settled without a penny piece. Being paid, and that the Macau senators claimed that a huge bribe had been paid so that they could embezzle a corresponding sum themselves. Now, in a different part, despite all these alarms and excursions, Lopo Sarmento G. Carvalho's first contract voyage proved a highly profitable one in the end. But he was forced to winter in Japan with his galleons, partly in order to complete their lading, but mainly because the Japanese authorities wished to detain them as security until the arrival of next year's values with their cargoes. Commenting on this movie a year later, the Captain General of Macau observed wryly, Estes negros, these blacks, uh, sick is added to represent an error. Thou diabolicos, or are diabolic, in su governo e atle now pagarin con afeto al g represar as viagens g un. So it's, uh, they're diabolic in their governance and until now haven't paid with effect uh, the um, recompense for trips of ano para otro, so year for year, year by year. Comprando hace as fazendas mais baratas e dando a sua prata a oncena. Pero esta ciudad con olfato seguro en terra, novo modo de ganar con poco pisco. So, buying the cheapest uh, places and giving um, their silver to uh, on Sena, that, that could mean a very variety of things, I think. Uh, but this city with... Um, secure fact secure uh like investment in the new world uh with um way of gaining uh, or or um, making uh with little risk so it's a less not very risky investment uh, that gives them security in the new world etc and uh, this explains why the Japanese merchants of Hakata and Nagasaki again invested heavily in silver loaned to the Portuguese on bottomry or espondencia, although so many of their debts were still outstanding. Now, this will give you an idea of exactly why the Portuguese, in this sense, not necessarily the Jesuits, but the Portuguese were so um, despised. Kramer gives us an interesting account of the arrival of the Portuguese in Nagasaki. Don Gonzalo is described as being a fine gentleman, accompanied by a most splendid suit of pages. Halberdiers and soldiers, all of them fine, fresh, and lusty lads, who daily paraded up and down with great pomp and pageantry, tricked out in costly garments. They are very cock-a-hoop over the great victory in the relief of Malacca, and are conceived that the whole world must bow down before them, although they are all greenhorns who have never been in Japan before. Their envoy is very proud and haughty, but he is not allowed to go up to the court, nor may he return home so that he will come to understand the Japanese better in due time. His retainers are mostly musicians and players, expert musical instruments, and the pages wear gilded rapiers, gold chains, and gray hats with white feathers. They give out that the ambassador, this ambassador is offered to remain in Japan until all questions and differences between them and the Japanese are completely settled, even if this should take eight or ten years for he will spare no pains in the service of his fatherland and for the honor of his king in order to obtain a personal interview with the emperor of now we uh, start with the series of attempted expulsion that were made based off of all of these acts that we saw previously leading up to of course the final uh, execution of the jesuit and of course the reason 
for the uh, the grudge that was held um, for over 300 years, culminating in the uh, battle with or the war with the Japanese using the ignorant United States military as the bludgeon. Here it states the captain major this year was Geronimo Pereira or Pejero, who reached Nagasaki in the great ship on the 16th or 17th of August. Before he left for Macau at the end of February 1889, 1589, he sent an envoy to compliment Hideyoshi with a large present. And this man found the dictator in an affable mood. Hideyoshi explained frankly that he had nothing against the Jesuit Padres personally, and that Christianity was probably a suitable religion for some other countries. But he went on to point out correctly enough that its propagation in Japan struck at the very roots of the Shinto and Buddhist beliefs on which the whole fabric of Japanese civilization was based. The Jesuits fully realized that Hideyoshi, who had a well-developed spy system, must been have, have been perfectly well aware that only three missionaries had left Japan as a consequence of his expulsion decree. They therefore deduced that he would not interfere with the vast majority who remained behind. The vast majority is redundant. Provided that they conducted themselves with tact and moderation. Hideyoshi continued to evince a largely lively interest in the promotion of the Macau-Nagasaki trade in which he had an important stake as can be seen by the following extract from the annual Jesuit letter from Japan, Kambakudono, sent this year to the port of Jesuit visitor Padre Alexandro Alexandro Valignano, together with the four Japanese envoys who left for Europe in 1582. Also, it should be noticed that Valignano is spelled in the Italian way. And a large reinforcement for the Jesuit mission in Japan, since it was obvious by this time that Hideyoshi was turning a blind eye to the fact that his expulsion degree of July 1587 had been not been carried out. Wasn't that interesting? The impressions of the Japanese envoys during their eight years' odyssey in Macau, India, and Europe are recorded in the exceedingly rare Latin work, De Missione Legatorum Ad Romanum. The indebtedness of the city of Macau in Japan became worse than ever this year, despite the impotent formations of Manuel da Camara G. Nono, whose apprehensions of an impending crash were fully justified. The city had borrowed 66,000 tails on Hespondencia at Nagasaki in 1632, for Respond. Although 150,000 tails were still owing to the Japanese for silver borrowed by the factor of the 6031 voyage. Francisco G. Lee's value. Of the former sum, 28,000 tails had been paid out again in Japan before the sailing of the Gallo Sao Jorge, or Jorge, or Jorge, Sao Jorge, in order to help redeem the goods of the Portuguese detained as a security for the unpaid debt, public and private, of 1631. In other words, the Portuguese were robbing Peter to pay Paul by borrowing lavishly from one set of Japanese merchants and money lenders to pay off part of what they owed to the others. The Japanese creditors, having finally realized this, put their heads together and, on an agreed day, made a unanimous demand for the settlement of all outstanding debts, save only the amount borrowed on the Sao George, or Jorge. The result was a debacle. Only a few of the Portuguese could pay their debts, and among the defaulters were four who failed with the amounts of 200,000, 300,000, 350,000, and 400,000 tails, respectively. These bankrupts could give no satisfaction to their creditors other than the statement that with the arrival of this year's gallius, they would receive a sufficient goods to enable them to repay what they owed. On the arrival of these... Well, <clears throat> off to a different section of the book. Wilhelm Verstigen, who kept his superiors at Hirado well posted as to the doings of their Portuguese rivals. Verstigen found the galleots in Nagasaki Harbor on the evening of the 23rd of August when he returned to that port from a trip to Hirado, and he immediately sent the following report to his chief. On my return here, I found unexpectedly six newly arrived galleots, richly and fully laden, having five having arrived on the 21st and the other next day. They include the Admiral and Vice Admiral and carrying a total of 942 men, including about 150 pure Portuguese and about the same number of half-castes. The remainder being their usual brood of Lascars, Kafirs, and Blacks, etc. Captain Major Dom Francis Francisco G. Casablanca, who has the voyage for three years as a nobleman, or at any rate must be called one, about 35 years old, and he has been here before as a captain of a ship. The factor... Simao Vaz Jipaiva, a one-handed man, 
was here for some years during the time of the embargo on their trade in hours 1628-1630, and was also their ambassador or envoy at Yeddo. Present ambassador or envoy is called Don, Don Joao, being slightly higher in rank than Don Gonzalo da Sil Silveira, who has now been transferred with his suite from the house of Alberto ben Benoit. Oh, Benois, ben, Benois, yeah. and brought to the island. Three of their galleots are almost fully laden with silk and peace goods, and the other three carry red chintzes, hemp, and other linen goods, china root, etc., which they have brought in great quantity. Verstichen adds that the Portuguese were all strictly searched before being allowed to land on Decima, where they found the the existing buildings insufficient for the needs and were busy putting up new shacks. The sails and rudders of their galleons were also removed during their stay in port. Now, um, in 1633, the Bakufu issued a proclamation that no more money was to be lent to the Portuguese on Respondencia, and that all existing debts were to be cancelled. This would account for the prosperity of the Macau trade despite the financial crash of the Macau debtors in Nagasaki that year. Admittedly, it does not explain why the Japanese should have been prepared to throw good money after bad by lending still more silver to the Portuguese, but the fact remains that they did so in defiance of their own government's prohibition. Now, Don Gonzalo G. Silveira was so far successful that he succeeded in obtaining the raising of the embargo on Portuguese trade at Nagasaki, although he himself, with the Gallio and the previous Captain Major Antonio G. Olvera G. Aranha, were compelled to remain in Japan as surety for the debts which the Macau merchants had incurred and which were variously estimated at 200,000 and 600,000 cruzados. The remaining four galleots and junk left Nagasaki for Macau on the 8th of November, very richly laden, according to the envious Hollanders. Now, I would say it's interesting to note, as it says down here, that instead of the uh, comment about the um, lading, that the... Uh, two quote-unquote high-ranking members were held as surety. That uh, sounds a lot like hostage to me, but that is essentially the scheme that is used by the courts to hold people on bail as surety that they won't run away, basically. And that's how a lot of people are imprisoned without actually standing trial. Now, the remaining four galleots and a junk left Nagasaki for Macau on the 8th of November, very richly laden according to the envious Hollanders. It is interesting to note that the bulk of their lading was silver boyan, which was taken up on respondencia from Japanese merchants. Now, this part is particularly, um, shall we say, disturbing, and uh, one has to wonder exactly what other crimes have been suppressed, considering this coming from the perspective of the Jesuits themselves. One complaint was that many Indian merchants at Goa, Kal, or Chal, and elsewhere were sending great quantities of merchandise to Macau through Portuguese traders who passed them through the local customs as their own property, thus evading payment of the full duties and defrauding the crown. Captain Majors of the Japan Voyage were repeatedly accused of abusing their privilege, privileges by illegally borrowing money from the estates of orphans and deceased persons at Macau and elsewhere. Legislation was also long past prohibiting the captain majors from wintering over long in Japan or from staying in Macau during the monsoon when they should have been in Nagasaki. Either of these practices naturally penalized the next comer whose voyage was thus unduly delayed. Now in a different section, Joao Sehau da Cunha finally reached Nagasaki as captain major of the great ship Nossa Senhora da Vida. Four years after leaving India in his protracted voyage, he was met with the news that Tokugawa Ieyasu had decreed the banishment of all foreign and Japanese missionaries from Japan, pending which they were concentrated under strict guard in Nagasaki, apart from those who had gone into hiding. Ieyasu had been contemplating this move for some time, and two years previously, Will Adams had told a Spanish envoy whom he met at the court that no padres would be left in Japan within three years. The reasons for Ieyasu's decision have been often been discussed, and only the three principal ones need be mentioned here. Many of the Japanese had always been suspicious of the real motives of the Jesuits and the friars, and could not understand that Europeans would come so far and live among a people so different from themselves for the sole purpose of preaching the gospel. The Bonses, Buddhist priests, had early mentioned that the Jesuits were merely agents of Portuguese imperialism, and were preparing the ground for the arrival of soldiers in an armada from Goa. 
Their fears were scouted by Oda Nobunaga, Otomo, Sorin, and other self-confident daimyo, but similar allegations against the Spanish friars later obtained far more credence, particularly since they were directly or indirectly supported by the affirmations of the Jesuits and the Portuguese. The real or alleged indiscretion of the pilot of the Manila Galleon San Felipe in 1596 made an impression which was never effaced, so that the subsequent intrigues of the English and Dutch against both Jesuits and friars found a ready hearing in Japan. Secondly, it was widely believed that the Japanese Christian converts were more obedient to their European spiritual fathers than to their unlawful feudal superiors, from which it followed that Christianity was a dangerously subversive religion. Yeah, once again, it's all about Christianity, right? Not the crimes of these people, specifically. Thirdly, an unfortunate series of political and financial scandals occurred in 1612-13, in which prominent Christian converts were deeply implicated and which further strengthened Ieyasu's conviction that the propagation of Christianity could no longer be tolerated in Japan. Just as Hideyoshi had done on the occasion of his expulsion in 1587, so did Ieyasu make it perfectly clear in 1614 that his prohibition was aimed solely at the missionaries and that the traders from Macau could continue to warmly be warmly welcomed, provided that they confined their activities to commercial matters. The shogun explicitly ordered that all favor and kind usage should be shown both to the captain major and the merchants, and this for a time raised false hopes among the missionaries. They asked Sahau Dakunya to plead personally with the shogun for the retention of one solitary church in Nagasaki for the use of the Portuguese. As had been implicitly permitted in Hideyoshi's time, the captain major was willing to do what was asked of him because of the inconvenience which captain captain would feel if the company was saying that by only granting or permitting them one church there on other occasions heretofore, they had by that means entered again into all the countries of Japan, and that therefore he would see if he could put them out for good and all. This news reached Nagasaki at the beginning of October, with the order that all Jesuits, friars, and native catechists must be embarked for Macau or Manila at the end of the month. Although a fair number of missionaries managed to go into hiding and conceal themselves in Japan, there was no wholesale evasion of the 1614 expulsion orders in the way that Hideyoshi's edict of 1587 had been. A fair number of missionaries managed to go into hiding and conceal themselves in Japan. There was no wholesale evasion of the... Uh, as the Hideyoshi's edict of 1587 had been flouted with impunity. All the fathers did desire to remain hid and disguised, them, disguised in Japan to help the Christians and be partakers in their sufferings. But it cannot be by reason of the strict order that was taken against their stay and the extreme difficulty in finding means to keep them secret. There were two small ships in the harbor besides the great ship, and this convoy of three sail left Nagasaki on the 7th, slash 8th of November. The Nosa Senora da... So, here we get an accounting uh, of what the Dutch were doing in Japan to help with the ultimate demise of the Jesuit Portuguese. However, it should be noted that the Dutch were also Christian, but not recognized by the quote-unquote Roman uh, Empire, which uses the veil of Christianity to conquer the world, basically, and has done so. So what is going on a lot here is that where one group is persecuted and the other isn't, that one group, the Jesuits, will state it's because they're Christian. It's always using that veil to... Um, protect themselves, because they're liars. Anyway, the Dutch lost no opportunity of pointing out that as long as the Gallios were allowed to come from Macau, so long would the Portuguese contrive to smuggle missionaries into the country and give aid and comfort to those who were in hiding. Early this year, the question of attacking Macau was seriously discussed in the Roju or Council of State, to which the Dutch had submitted plans for an attack on the colony. It was known that this petition was discussed in council, wherein three of the five councillors who were present voted in favor of the Dutch, saying on their behalf that although they had been hitherto of little use to the Japanese, yet in future they would be of more use to Japan than were the Portuguese, on whose account the justices every year killed some 250 or 300 persons, of whom 15 to 20 were executed for crime and the remainder for Christianity. Yeah, right. And for this reason, they thought the Portuguese were the most prejudicial. The rest of the council, however, were of a contrary opinion, and for this reason, the Dutch petition was not proceeded with. 
Now, of course, the question is, how did the Portuguese get away with so many blatant crimes? And um, how did they retain their position over Japan uh, and were able to flout so obviously and arrogantly the laws of that nation? The combination of God and Mammon, which typified Jesuit missionary and mercantile activities in Japan, was devised by an incident which occurred or evinced at the Shogunro court this year. Some ill-disposed persons complained to Ayasu that the anti-Christian edicts had been allowed to become a dead letter, and they suggested that the Jesuits should be turned out of the establishment. And in a different section, the desire of the Kyushu Daimyo to attract the great ships to their own ports was explained by Padre Lorenzo Mexia in his annual report for 1580, as follows. As these Japanese lords, even though they have much land, are very poor in revenue and ready money. A man cannot easily describe how pleased they are when a Portuguese ship enters one of their ports, owing to the profits which they derive therefrom. Umura, consequently, was annoyed that Arima had succeeded in luring the great ship back. Now, in a different section, however, the influential minister, Honda Kosuke Nosuke Masazumi, and two or three other lords who were our friends at once objected to this, saying that, on the contrary, the Padres were of great benefit to Japan, since it was in their shadow that the Portuguese came in the great ship from China, and the Kubo, Ieyasu, agreeing with observation. The others did not dare to give vent to their feelings in words anymore. So there you go, that's the explanation. It's a early version of what now, of now today we call Keynesian economics, which is control of a people via outward economic means, essentially control the supply, economy-wise, from afar, and uh, if they uh, disobey, then you cut that off, essentially. But of course, naturally, there are many other angles to view. Here it states, the city of the name of God in China had already achieved an unenviable reputation for internal strife and discord frequently ending in bloodshed in which Japanese resident slaves and itinerant traders evidently joined with a will. Such, at any rate, as is a fair deduction from vice-regal decree issued in April of this year, which expressly forbade any Japanese of any quality or condition whatsoever who may be living in the city of Macau or who may happen to arrive there from wearing any sword, large or small, even if he was a slave accompanying his Portuguese master. Now, here's an interesting part that also has to do with the slavery of the Japanese under Portuguese Jesuits. Although the Portuguese trade in Kyushu prospered exceedingly, and the Camoys in his Luciadas could sing of Japan as yielding the best silver mine, yet relations between the representatives of the farthest east and farthest west do not always run smoothly, as can be seen from the tenor of a crown ordinance issued at Lisbon in March 1571. In this ordinance, the crown, obviously at the prompting of the Jesuit missionaries, yes, obviously, right, obviously, categorically forbade the enslavement of any Japanese whatsoever, principally because of hindrance to the conversion of the heathen which arises from this practice. Yeah, that's definitely not said with a measure of contempt. All those Japanese who might be enslaved in future were to be freed unconditionally and the slave owners and slave traders concerned punished by the confiscation of all their property. Same ordinance likewise strictly forbade the practice of the Portuguese who go and trade in Japan, changing their weights and scales, selling with some and buying with others. All to the great prejudice of the Japanese, which is likewise a great hindrance to their conversion. Henceforward, the Portuguese were to buy and sell by whatever local weights and measures were customary in the areas in which they traded. Despite the severe penalties proclaimed for infractions of these two laws, first at any rate remained a dead letter for several, several decades, and it is unlikely that the second was rigorously preserved. Yeah, and I would say it probably still goes on today. It's just the usual declare um, declare yourself contrary to it, but then everybody practices it openly, and um, that's just how it goes, right? Like declarations against pedophilia, and then you find pretty much all of the priests involved in some sort of child trafficking scheme. The practice of trading with one's own weights and scales was a widespread one in the Far East. Now, of course, the Jesuits, as always, are involved all over the planet on behalf of the Vatican, and it was the same in this century as it is now. 
Don Geronimo accordingly sailed for Japan, leaving his brother, Don Gonzalo, as acting governor. But he was soon forced to return to Macau by contrary winds. On his return, he thought better of his first decision and decided to remain at his original post, particularly as news reached the colony of an expected Dutch attack. And some 300 men had already left for North China to help the Ming Emperor against an invasion of the Manchu Tartars. Manchu is Manchuria. And they were predominantly, I would say, uh, nomadic. And they are not, and to the day themselves, still do not uh, believe themselves to be Chinese. That is a declaration from the UN, a claiming of them as, quote unquote, subjects or property of the UN China corporate entity, which operates obviously on behalf of the Vatican as always. But as we notice here, Ming, the Ming Emperor worked with the Jesuits and they sent men to help them in their fighting of the Manchu Tartars. So it is interesting to take that into account when thinking about the propaganda, uh, the anti-Japanese propaganda around the World War II era in which they constantly state that it was in fact the Japanese that slaughtered the Manchurians, or quote unquote the Chinese in Manchuria. When in fact the Manchurians are not Chinese, they don't consider themselves Chinese, and it was more than likely the quote unquote Chinese, being obviously the UN uh, designation that actually slaughtered the Manchurians, considering they are age old enemies. But naturally, wherever they go, they get in trouble because they are corruptors and they are there to violate the law under the guise of religion. This is a Macau where getting in trouble with the Cantonese this year for their real or alleged insubordination and disregard for Chinese laws. In this year, the Cantonese authorities severely censored the Senate of Macau for allowing so many Japanese to frequent that port, although Japanese were forbidden to visit China on pain of death. The Portuguese were told that their uh, Negroes should suffice them for retainers, and they were not to employ Japanese on any pretext. 98 Japanese found in Macau by a visiting Chinese official were summarily deported. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please check out my other publications, my other channels, my other uh, content, and there are free books available at the links. And if so, you so choose, you may support them.